Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Um, we're almost finished with our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. And I want to update you on two things very quickly. First is I did not go up to Corvallis. I discovered I had to take a midterm yesterday, actually, as it turns out. So I did not go to Corvallis. I studied. But Rick Gold of the Eugene Peaceworks went with his group, and he said he, they were dumbfounded, which I don't know why they were shocked. But the scientists there all said basically that Fukushima only killed one person and that radiation is proving to be not that harmful and that um, it's really it's not that big a deal and we should look forward to the clean technology. And they did say that there were three people that were kind of anti-nuclear because about the spent fuel rods, but nobody really put up any objections. So that's one thing. Uh, I think it relates to this chapter that we're reading. The title of the chapter is the moral and social responsibility of science and scientists. So I think that is quite timely. Um, and the second thing is, is I do not think I'm going to read a book after I'm finished with this. I'm going to make an effort to go through my this whole entire book and pull out good portions of it because a lot of it, like probably three-fourths of it is just blah, blah, blah and hard to listen to, which thank you for listening anyways. <laughs> but... I want to make like smaller little vignettes and use it. This is, in fact, why I put it on Creative Commons in case somebody who is better at all this editing stuff than me can take the parts of it that's really good and compile it and make something really awesome. But I've decided, I haven't seen it, so I've decided I'm going to do that myself. And um, I'm actually going to get a software program. Uh, my friend Ed is helping me figure out which is a good one. And... Um, so that's my next project. So let me get back to reading this book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. We're on Chapter 11, Moral and Social Responsibility of Science and Scientists. So let me take off my glasses so I can read better. The radiation hazards controversy is of monumental importance to man and his ability to survive on this planet. It may therefore surprise the reader that when we say this issue is totally dwarfed by a vastly larger problem, of which the radiation hazards issue is but a reflection. The larger problem goes to the heart of the matter, not only survival of this planet, but to the quality of existence on Earth. We refer to the truly significant crisis involving the social and moral responsibility of scientists and technologists for their actions. The radiation hazards controversy is now in the open, where no amount of subterfuge again will hide it. It will be resolved. The personal fate of the scientists involved in this controversy is a trivial matter in any larger sense. But the general role of science and technology in society is now in sharper focus than ever. The radiation problem is simply illustrative of the dilemma we reach when scientists and technologists fail in their responsibility to society. It may seem a trivial truism that science and technology should serve society, but has it in the past, and does it now? If the answers to these questions were an unequivocal yes, there would be no environmental crisis occupying a prime position in our thoughts today. And why is the answer truly no? Must this we must examine in its several important facets, interlinking, interlocking in character, and all of supreme importance for a viable, free society. The phenomenal accomplishments of science and technology over more than a century have certainly revolutionized the way we live. That, sense, that some of the changes are clearly beneficial to man is undeniable although only shock and dismay should properly be our reaction to the unevenness at which those benefits have been distributed. But surely advances in agricultural methods, in medicine, in production of industrial items can all be regarded as manifestations of enormous talents of men. Admiration of such talent is inescapable. Conversion of such admiration into a cult of worship of science and technology is an unmitigated disaster for humanity and by no means solely in an ecological sense. For the cult of worship of science and technology generates two important idols. One, 
self-worship of the scientists and technologists. And two, worship of science and technology as gods in themselves. The effects of establishment of these two idols are pervasive and destructive in some ways that we now all realize. Simply by looking around at the neglect we bestow so magnanimously upon so large a segment of humanity. No kidding. New subtitle. Science fails to meet societal needs. No shit, Sherlock. Science and technology have failed in the task of solution of key in the solution of key problems. We see demonstrable poverty for 50% of our people in the United States, no matter what the official statistics say. We see disenfranchisement of a major fraction of our citizens, no matter what the voter registration ostensibly shows. We see alienation of the bulk of those to whom the future should belong, if indeed even if the future is left for them. These effects are self-evident. But the subtle effects are even worse, precisely because of their subtlety, which allows for the development of a saintly halo around scientists. And this virtually ensures that the worst possible errors of science and technology are not only permitted, they are encouraged and made ever more pervasive. Hello, Catherine Higley at the University of Oregon. The errors became pillars of the culture itself, above and beyond the non-contribution of meeting of, to meeting of key societal needs. Wow. The error becomes pillars of the culture itself, above and beyond the non-contribution to meeting of key societal needs. It can hardly be stated that many human beings of intellect devote their lives to evil motives or goals. And it is the totally counterproductive and it is totally counterproductive to use such a premise in the endeavor to understand the ultimate deleterious effects of science plus technology and their practitioners. Let us eliminate all consideration of bad motives, of impugning the motives of any single scientist or technology. Okay, we'll include Catherine Higley in that. Indeed, let us credit every decision, every action with the best of intentions. Does this give us reason for confidence, for reassurance that the interests of society will be paramount, that societal needs will be met? Hardly. For the cult of self and entity worship develops an inevitable dynamic of its own, answerable to no outside influence and characterized by a relentless pursuit of its own ends. And all the while a self-righteous proclaim us and all the while a self-righteousness proclaims I'm sorry I'm going to read that again and all the while a self-righteousness proclaims repeatedly that everything is being done to create a utopian dream for man if he would but understand and appreciate the devoted attention to his welfare. Why are we surprised that a central feature of a cult or worship of science and technology should be the concept that more, that more and more of the same science and technology are obviously needed, desirable, indeed, the sine qua non of a better world. For are not the works remarkable, breathtaking, almost fictional? Indeed they are, but it is but a short it is but a short step to the assumption that what science technology cannot do isn't worth doing. A short step to the view that no matter what uses are made of science and technology, no matter what dire effects may thereby be created, Science and technology will surely provide an answer. Omnipotence is the essence of the idol. And so it is that for every problem created by a cult of its own self-aggrandizement, there is assumed there must be a solution available, available through the very agencies and forces that produce the devastating problems in the first place. Hmm. 
It is not at all unexpected that science and technology in the service of industry and government, having led us to the brink of so many disasters, should be ready to proclaim proudly that in the interests of the general welfare, these same stalwarts are prepared to provide us with their services in providing a solution. There is not a single instance, or a few at best, where this sequence is not descriptive of the real world story. For transportation in the ultimate, we were blessed by the automobile in its infernal combustion engine, for every man his own personal dream. And a dream it must be, sexy, in the color of his choice or two, and replete with devices about as, re as, rela about as related to efficient transportation as a cold head is to a happy day in life. I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. <clears throat> I'm going to read the whole paragraph again so we get the gist of this. I'm sorry, I'm not reading it very well. It is not all an ex it is it is not at all unexpected that science and technology in the service of industry and government, having led us to the brink of so many disasters, should be ready to proclaim proudly that in the interests of the general welfare, these same stalwarts are prepared to provide us with their services in providing a solution. There is not a single instance, or few at best, where this sequence is not descriptive of the real world story. For, trans for transportation in the ultimate, we were blessed by the automobile with its infernal combustion engine for every man his own personal dream. And a dream it must be, sexy, in the color of his choice or two, and replete with devices about as related to efficient transportation as a head cold is to a happy day in life. Okay, now I get it. And now that we have come to realize that it is e either us or the automobile, we are promised solutions. We are promised solutions are just around the corner for technology will develop fuel additives or exhaust devices that will surely bring us back to that simple ideal of breathable air. Hmm. New subtitle. Development of nuclear weapons to ensure peace. For defense, the nuclear weapon is the greatest bargain in bargain in bang for your buck yet conceived by man. And who is to deny that big bang potential will assuredly drive off would-be enemies? Shortly after World War II, the pronouncements were pontifically made that with this advancement, war would no longer be thinkable. And we've had nothing but nonstop war since then. Science and technology had right the everlasting peace so cherished and so effervescent for so long. But soon the clouds gathered as we realized, as the realization dawned that the science technology cult existed in more than one geographic area of the globe. Two, it was found, can play at this game and the fear returned, only larger. That war was not only possible, it held potentialities never before realizable. Quickly to the rescue, science technology achieved this remarkable answer that more and more nuclear weapons could be built by dedicated effort. Bigger too, a thousandfold more destructive, again guaranteeing a secure peace, until too many powers joined this elite set of guarantors. Then, delivery, then deliver them faster the miracle of the missile. But they, too, had missiles. Then create an anti-missile. No problem. Here, assuredly, was the ultimate in humane considerations. The nuclear weaponeers foresaw a new golden era. No longer man against man, but machine against machine. Brilliant beyond belief. For MIRV, the answer to anti-missiles, we can assuredly count on some form of technology born anti-MIRV. Those who question whether this whole sequence has increased anyone's defense or security simply don't understand what science and technology have to offer. This is a solution, we are assured, if we will but support the noble science technology effort 
to the almost total exclusion of every worthwhile human endeavor. It's exactly what we're doing. It is, if the weather is bad, science and technology will assuredly learn how to modify it. If such modifications lead to disastrous ecological changes, leave it to devoted science and development to find a solution. Chemtrails and radiation, no life. If science and technology have increased the Earth's bounty in crops, an agricultural revolution, we know we should have counted on similar brilliance to develop the pervasive defoliants and herbicides to guarantee that the crops at all will no longer be possible in those areas of the world we so avidly decide to civilize. Wow. Uh, I'm going to stop here, you guys. It's 15 minutes. I'm beginning to read bad, but this is very interesting. Uh, the next subtitle is The SST, a quote, monstrous abortion, unquote. Huh. So we are in Chapter 11, and I'll end here. Put your courage feet on, you guys. Um, let's just press on. I personally am not going to let any of the bullshit get to me. And I'm just going to press on. And I hope that others will do the same. We definitely need to be calling our own senators. My senator is Ron White and Jeff Merkley. My elected congressman is Peter DeFazio. And I need to call my governor's office, Governor Kate Brown. And we need to tell them that we want to stop nuclear. That is, we've got to find solutions and we've got to stop the lying by the scientists. We must demand truth in science. So I'll end here. Ciao. Bye, you guys.